How is everyone doing today? Are we great? Okay, good. Um, it's so wonderful to have all of you here. I love all the colors and everyone's outfits look so great. Um, I'm so happy that all of you are here and I get to talk to you. So I would love to lead you in today's verse from Psalm 133. So if you'd stand with me. This verse is, or this scripture is all about unity in the church. And unity is something that is so vital to a healthy church and a healthy congregation. And unity is so much more than some people deciding, oh, I'll work with them, I like them. No, it's a whole group deciding together that they're going to put others' needs before themselves. And the sacrifices that you have to make for other people, those that Christ-like love, the unselfish love is so important. So think about that while you read this and think of what you can do to put others before yourself and live in unity with the church and with people around you. So let's read this. How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. It is like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down on the collar of his robe. It is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion. For there the Lord bestows his blessings, even life forevermore. This is the word of the Lord. Hallelujah. Well, in the spirit of unity, we're going to have one unified voice and we're going to praise our God together. Are we ready to praise the Lord? Psalm says, let everything that have breath praise the Lord. Lord, we praise you. Let everything, let everything that has breath. I'll praise when surrounded. 
worthy. You're worthy of glory and honor and praise. Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for your goodness, your mercy, your love. Lord, we do thank you for unity. We thank you that you have called us to be a unified people, that you've called us to be a unified church, that you've called us to be unified sons and daughters. Lord, we thank you for your holiness. You are holy. You're mighty. You're worthy. You're great. You're powerful. You're awesome. We acknowledge those things in your presence, Father, in the name of Jesus. Thank you for your holiness, Father. Thank you, God.
perfect in power, love, and purity. That's also how that song ends in another stanza. Today is the seventh Sunday of Easter. And for some of us, we can barely remember Easter seven weeks ago. But when it comes to why we are here, when it comes to coming around the table of the Lord at his invitation, it is because Christ has come. And Christ has lived to teach us what does it mean to love one another? What does it mean to love God with our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength? What does it mean to love our neighbors as ourselves? What does it mean to lay down our lives as he has laid down his? To love one another as he has first loved us. As we heard earlier, that's the only way unity is possible among any group of people, including in the church of Jesus Christ. Amen. That we love each other in this way. And when we come around the table, that is the invitation. Christ says, I have come that you might have life and have it abundantly. And he shows us what it means to say that he is the way to experience that life. He is the truth about what real abundant life entails. And he is that life himself that he so freely offers with us that we might be forgiven, that we might be reconciled to God and reconciled to one another. Because how many of you all know that we all need reconciliation? Not just one time, but again and again. If you haven't offended somebody today, just wait, it's still early. But the church is meant to be the people of God who recognize our need to be reconciled in this way. And humbly, we seek that with the Lord and we seek that with and from and offer it to one another. So right now, I invite our servers to come forward. The rest of you, please feel free to be seated in the presence of the Lord and one another as part of his church, his people. And so as our communion servers, as our prayer team comes to take their position, I'm going to ask you right now to quiet your hearts, quiet your minds, let all the distractions of this week go. And right now in this space, whether you're with us in the sanctuary, whether you're with us online and you are gathering elements in your own home, if it's crackers and grape juice, if it's bread and wine, whatever it may be, right now I want you just to concentrate on who he is. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Who are we that he would be mindful of us? Who are we that he should send his son that whoever would receive him, whoever would believe in him, need not perish but might have everlasting life? That's not just about going to heaven when we die. It's about a quality of life now we can have in the hope and the peace and the joy and the love and the truth of who God is revealed through Christ. Life lived in the power of the Holy Spirit. So right now, I invite you the scriptures say to examine ourselves as we come around the table that we might recognize where we stand in need of reconciliation, where we stand in need of forgiveness, that we would confess with our mouths and offer our hearts as living sacrifices to our Lord. For he is faithful to forgive us our sins if we confess our sins. So right now, Lord, I ask that you would just bring to our hearts, bring to our minds where we need forgiveness, where we need reconciliation, the broken parts of our lives, the broken parts of our hearts, Lord. And we offer those to you now. It's your invitation, Lord God. confess individually now we confess corporately with the prayer of contrition the words will be on the screen would you share in this prayer with me most merciful God we confess that we have sinned against you in thought word and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone we have not loved you with our whole heart we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves we are truly sorry and we humbly repent for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. May Almighty God have mercy on us and as a minister of the gospel, it is my privilege to be able to 
convey to you that that prayer prayed with sincerity and with a humble and contrite heart, God receives that we might be forgiven, that our sins might be removed from us as far as the east is from the west, that we might walk in freedom, knowing that through Christ Jesus, we are made one with our Father in the eternal love of the Holy Spirit. Amen. On the night when Jesus was betrayed, as you may recall, he took bread. After blessing it and giving thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat all of you. This is my body broken for you. And do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, Jesus took the cup. After giving thanks and blessing it, he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for the forgiveness of sins for many. Take and divide it among yourselves. And each time you drink of it, do this in remembrance of me. Would you pray with me? Holy and merciful God, we thank you that while we were yet sinners, Christ came to live for us, to die for us, that we might be forgiven the righteous dying for the unrighteous, the holy dying for that which has been profaned, Lord, the one who gave his life that we might be made whole. So Father, we come now to this Eucharist to give you thanks to glorify you for who you are and what you have done and what you are continuing to do by your spirit now alive in us and through us. Holy Spirit, unite our hearts with Almighty God, what it means now for us to be united as your body, Lord God. Move in and through your people that we might be a church united by the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus, that we would be nourished by your spirit, that we would be revived and replenished by all that you provide, Lord, which is nothing less than yourself that your body would be nourished Lord God for who you are making us and uniting us to be for such a time as this so Father we come our hearts all that we have to offer you our lives all that we have to offer you you who is the Lord the giver of life the one by whom you have redeemed our lives through your own death, Lord Jesus. We celebrate you, we give you thanks, and we humbly come recognizing what you have done, celebrating who you are, and glorifying you. Holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. In the name above all names, the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, the Lamb, the Lion, our Savior, the one who has called us your friends. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. We'll serve our, our communion servers first and they'll take their places across the front, one in each corner of the balcony. At that time, you'll be free to come and receive these elements as you feel the Spirit leads you. As you'll receive a piece of the bread, we receive by intinction. And so you'll take the bread, dip that in the cup, and then receive both elements together. Take your time. This is a time of meditation and prayer, communing around the table, celebrating who God is, celebrating together as the family that he is making us more and more every day. And so we give God the glory and thank him for this time now.
come. The table is set. The gifts of God for the people of God. Amen. You are my desire. No one else will do. Because no
our surrender saying whatever Lord whatever happens whatever lot whatever hell may come my way it is well with my soul and why because I know that you're good and that you're good for me and that you're good to me and that your plans for me are good and so it is well with my soul whatever God whatever comes my way it is well because you're good you are good, you're good. Today and this week and in the presence of the Holy Spirit that we feel here today so glad that you're here take a moment now and let's step and talk to one another share the peace of Christ with one another may you be blessed this day such a great thing when everybody gets to greet one another passing the peace of Christ that we've been so freely given how can we not share that with each other so for those of us online as well. Our good friend Avi shared with you just moments ago, but we extend the peace of Christ to you too. So glad you're with us today. So here in the room, as we make our way back to our seats, want to make sure that you know if you're visiting with us for the first time, we, every Sunday we have folks that are uh, with us, have not been with us before, and so we certainly welcome you. We welcome everybody, but we certainly welcome our, our visitors. And whether it's your first time with us, or whether you've been with us uh, a number of times and you're saying to yourself, I'd like to know more about Christ Church. I'd like to know more about how I can get connected, how I can get plugged in. Uh, we're always, always seeking who God is leading to, to get connected in community, who's looking to get connected in service, both these things. So some easy ways you can do that. The first way is after service, just meet us in the lobby. Whether it's on the main floor or the balcony level, you can connect with us at the connect wall. It's funny how that's named that. And uh, we have people there that would love to help 
uh, tell you more about Christ Church, what God is doing in the midst of our church, how you can get connected, how you can be more involved. We want to know more about who you are and what God's doing in your life, what God is leading you to, right? So another way you can do it is you can send us a text, and you can do that right now even. You can text CONNECT to 615-205-1098. And we will absolutely uh, be back in touch with you very soon. Uh, You also can just fill out a card that's right there in the pews. You'll see it in the racks, either below the pew or or in the rack in front of you. And if you're old school and want to fill one of those out, we will absolutely get back to you this week and connect with you that way as well. So we don't want anybody to feel like they're going through this life alone. We don't want anyone to feel like this is a big church. I can't get connected. There are ways to overcome that. And, And so please reach out and let us connect with you. It's our privilege, our honor to do that, all right? Another way you can know more about what's going on is our digital bulletin. So if you have your phone, uh, you can certainly scan the QR code that's on the screen right now, or you can scan the QR code that's posted on the backside of your pew if you're here in the building. That has information not only for today and what's happening in the life of the church today, but also it has information about what's coming up this week and beyond. Uh, So much there. So we want you to get in the habit every single week of of looking over our digital bulletin and staying informed in that way. That's so important. Uh, So everything you need to know is in there. All right. Today, certainly, uh, for all those who are with us, happy Mother's Day to our mothers here in the room and beyond. We're so thankful, and so what we'd like to do is just take a moment and uh, let, let's pray. Let's pray for our mothers. Let's pray for all those who are with us uh, in, in this way. Let's, let's pray. Father, we just give you thanks. We give you thanks for the gift of motherhood. What a blessing that is. And, and so many of us can recall uh, life with our mothers and, and, and moments of, of tender nurture, moments of encouragement and comfort, Moments of of, of protection and unbelievable provision, Lord, that we did not always recognize in the moment nor appreciate as maybe we could have or should have. So, Lord, how beautiful it is that as we describe our mothers in this way, we could be describing you, your character, your nature as the nurturer, the comforter, the one who protects and provides, the one who encourages, who comes alongside us to never leave us, never forsake us. And so many of us have known motherhood in that way, and for that we give you thanks, Lord God, and we celebrate mothers who who love in that way and serve in that way, Lord, and lay down their lives for their children and their grandchildren, and so we give you thanks, God. Lord, we know that there are those who who have not known uh, mothers in that way in this life, and there is grief on a day like this. There is pain on a day like this. Or maybe our our mothers or our grandmothers have, have gone on before us, Lord, and are now in your presence, no longer with us on this side, Lord. And so, Lord, we pray for, for comfort this day that only you can provide. We, we pray for, for your arms, O oh God, to surround us spiritually, that our hearts would be comforted, that we would be nurtured, as our mothers or grandmothers might do if they were here, Lord, but now we, we depend upon you in such a real way as we always can and always should, Lord. And so we give you thanks for that. Lord, we lift up those who are grieving today for they long to be mothers. And for any number of reasons, that has not come to pass, Lord. That has not happened. Or or maybe they are mothers who are for some reason estranged from their children or, or their grandchildren. There is brokenness there in relationship. And so today is a heavy day. Today there is pain and there is grief there, Lord, that only you can touch, only you can minister to. So, Lord, no matter where we may fall, if it's a mixture of thanksgiving and joy and celebration today, but also grief and sadness and loss, sometimes life is is, is just exactly that. And so whatever it might be, Lord God, you transcend it all. You are the one to whom we can turn with our joy and thanksgiving, but also our, our pain and our sorrow. You are the one who says, come to me, come to me. So as a hen would gather her brood beneath her wings, as the eagle covers her hatchlings with her wings in the nest, Lord God, you are the one. The Bible gives us these images of a mother caring for her young so tenderly. And so would you do that, Lord God, in in powerful ways we can discern and, and recognize this day. We thank you for motherhood. We thank you 
for the gift of love that you pour out. We thank you for who you are revealed in it all, Lord God. Lord, we thank you for those women who love and sacrifice for children who are not their own biologically, children that they have not born or carried in their own wombs, Lord, and yet they love in that way. And I know every single one of us hearing my voice right now has known that kind of love coming through a, a mother who may not have borne us but has loved us with a mother's love. And so, Lord, thank you for those special women in our lives as well. So, Lord, we give you thanks. We praise you. We glorify you for this gift so precious by your design. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. Something else to celebrate. I want to invite three young ladies to join me on on the platform here now. We have some graduations to celebrate. Come on up, ladies. Come on up. Come right in the center. So today, we do want to recognize some of our, our seniors here, both high school and college. And so we want to make sure that, uh, that we honor them, celebrate them for all of their hard work and dedication. And, and, and all three of these ladies I've known for quite some time. And to see them continue just to, to grow in their gifts and talents God's given them, how hard they have worked to develop those and steward those. And so this closing of one season, opening of a next is something that we rightfully need to stop and celebrate as church family. So, so standing right next to me, is Sarah Cagna. Yeah. And so Sarah has graduated from Lee University. And her parents are delighted to know she's already gainfully employed. She'll be starting starting as a second grade teacher not too far from here at Edmondson Elementary this fall and that's a wonderful school and they are blessed to have you Sarah that's going to be great she's also getting married before too long that's a big deal it's a big deal yeah He's a, yeah so congratulations Sarah we are so proud of you next to Sarah is Ellie Rowe <laughs> Ellie is a Belmont University grad Sunday after Sunday, you'll see Ellie. She serves in our choir. She's got an amazing musical gift that God has given her. She serves in so many wonderful ways. And uh, we're just honored every time you share that with us, for sure, Ellie. And it's a blessing. So she is, rightfully so, makes sense, moving to New York this fall to pursue music. So we are so thankful. We're going to be praying for you, Ellie, for sure. Congratulations. Congratulations. And last but not least, we have Layla Williams all the way down on the end. So Layla is graduating high school from Templeton Academy, and she's getting ready to start right where these ladies began four years ago, Belmont University. She'll be a freshman there in the fall. Any ideas about major yet, Layla? Uh, Psychology or nursing. Psychology or nursing. So I need need both. So that's great. That's awesome. That's great. So ladies, we want to pray for you right now if we could. And, and ladies, let's, let's, let's go ahead and extend our, our hands, if you would, Christ Church family. Let's pray for God's blessing, God's provision over them. So Father, we are so thankful for who you are in the lives of these young ladies. Thank you for your gifts that you've poured within them. It's been such a privilege for their families and us as a church family to see them grow, to see them continue to mature into the the women of God that you have created them and and, and saved them, called them, are refining them to be. And so Lord, continue to provide for their needs, continue to guide them, lead them, direct them. Lord, we thank you for what you've brought them through. And as you're continuing to to prepare them for this next chapter, Lord. We pray your protection upon them. Bless them in their relationships, Lord, in the new chapter, wherever that's going to lead them professionally and wherever that's going to lead them relationally. Lord, we just pray that you'll continue to have your hand upon them as they seek your will for their lives. Lord, as they tenderly submit themselves to you, Lord God, recognizing you as as Father, recognizing you as Lord, recognizing you as the one who has ordered their steps. You formed them in their mother's womb. You knew them even before that day. And so, Father, we are so grateful for what it means to send them now into this next season with your blessing, knowing that your hand is upon them. So bless their families, Lord, in this time of transition. And sometimes that's more challenging than we realize and letting go. And so bless them knowing that these ladies belong to you even before that you belong to your mothers and your fathers. Lord, bless them. We're so thankful for them. 
In Jesus' name, we celebrate them as we celebrate you, the giver of all good gifts, including these three young ladies. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. So thank you, ladies. Thank you so much. Thank you. One last thing, we want to make sure that you're aware of another uh, great group of people who are part of, of our Christ Church family, people who, who serve so faithfully week in and week out. It's our Joyful Hands ministry. And, and this is a, yes, give them a, give them a hand. So when it comes to crocheting and quilting and, and, and knitting, this group gathers every week and they, they meet in one of our classrooms. And so today, if you haven't seen it yet, Right out here in the, in the lobby, in our serve center, they have several different items they have made on display. All throughout the year, I want you to know, when we dedicate babies, every one of those families gets a, a, a blanket that this, this uh, a quilt that this wonderful ministry has put together. In the wintertime, when it comes to hats and, and scarves and mittens to care for those who are, who are in most need, when it comes to so many other ways that, that this group comes together and in fellowship, they, they gather, they pray, they, they create these beautiful works of art that also function to nurture and bless and care for people in our church, but also people in our community. And so stop by today, celebrate uh, the Joyful Hands ministry, thank them for what they do. They, they've got items there that I think you can pick up for a donation and, and we would love to see you support them in that way so so we are so thankful to joyful hands for who you all are and if you're a part of that ministry and you're here with us right now would you mind just standing let us honor you right where you are please stand let us thank you ladies all right scattered around thank you all absolutely very good very good and so last but not least during this time and uh, we want to make sure that we honor the Lord with our, our time of giving, tithes and offerings. And so we recognize this as much a part of our worship as everything else is in the life of the community. We give because God has given so freely to us. And so everything that we contribute, uh, when it comes to giving, we ask that you would ask the Lord, what would it be, Father, that you would ask of me to give? Everything that we have is his. As we've been singing all morning, I mean, even the breath in our lungs belongs to him. Everything that passes through our hands as a, as a church is meant to be for his kingdom's cause. And so we are so thankful that God provides. He promises to meet our needs, especially as we give as much as we can to care for and love and serve one another and those around us. So as the Lord is leading you, let's pray for how we would give. Father, we just give you thanks. We recognize your faithfulness. And you bless us, Lord God, in all ways so that we might be a blessing. And so, Father, we certainly recognize that in, in material ways, Lord. You provide to meet our needs in abundance so that we may uh, provide for others, Lord. So thank you for how you give to us that you might give through us. And so, Lord, we know there are those here that might be uh, on the, the, the need, uh, have the need, I should say, to be receiving help at this time. Lord, we want to be able to do that as church family. Lord, there are times where we know what it is to, to, to need help. There are other times where we know what it is to have abundance to give and provide that help. And so, Lord, we ask that wherever we may be, Lord, we are still part of your family needing one another. So, Lord, let us give faithfully to how you lead us in the ways that you direct us. And, Lord, give us wisdom, give us discernment that everything that you provide, Lord God, is used for your kingdom's cause responsibly, accountably, faithfully. Nothing that we have, nothing that we are belongs to us, Lord. It is all yours, and we give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. May the Lord bless you as you give. Amen. expressed a mother's love. A mother's love is something that no one can explain. It is made of deep devotion and of sacrifice and pain. It is endless and unselfish and enduring come what may. For nothing can destroy it or take that love away. It is patient and forgiving when all others are forsaking. And it never fails or falters, even though the heart is breaking. It believes beyond believing when the world around condemns. And it glows with all the beauty 
of the rarest, brightest gems. If you've ever expressed a mother's love to someone else, then you have shown the love of God. So may this tribute honor you and ultimately glorify God. How can I say thanks for the things you have done? for me things so undeserved yet you give to prove your love for me the voices of a million angels could not express everybody. <laughs> hey, buddy. So honored to be here with you this morning. If you would, would you stand with me? We're going to read our opening scripture for our message this morning. Our message is taken from John chapter 17, starting at verse 17. And it's, we're reading from the NLT this morning. It reads like this. Make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word, which is truth. Just as you sent me into the world, I'm sending them into the world. And I give myself as a holy sacrifice 
for them so they can be made holy by your truth. I am praying not only for these disciples, but also for whoever will believe in me through their message. I pray that they will all be one. My God, I could preach right there. Just as you and I are one. As you are in me, Father, and I am in you. And may they be in us so that the world will believe you sent me. I have given them the glory you gave me so they may be one as we are one. I am in them and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. This is the gospel of the Lord. Before you get seated today, why don't you look to your neighbor and tell them, go ahead and run him back. Come on, look at the person next to you and tell them to run him back. I know you don't know what I'm talking about, but I'm the youth pastor. We say things that people don't normally hear in their culture. So look at the person next to you and tell them to run it back. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. Thank you. You may be seated. When I tell you to run it back, it just simply means let's do what we've done before. Let's take it back a little bit like we have before. Well, good morning. Before I get into all of that, I want to say I'm so glad to see your wonderful faces this morning. And I'm honored and privileged to be able to stand on this platform. I want to first give honor to my pastor. That's right. Mess with him and see. My pastor. Our pastor. Come on, somebody. And as we say in the church of, I'm going to be a little darker, our first lady of the house this morning. Come on, give it up for our first family. Because they got to deal with us, all of us, okay? So uh, that's grace and enough. But my name is Clarence. Uh, I'm the student pastor here at Christ Church. I pastor the amazing Christ Church youth. And this morning, I don't want to belabor it too long. Uh, I just want to let you know, I I, I get loud. I hope that don't scare you. If it does, take it up with Jesus. Um, I I am super passionate about what I do. Uh, I I will probably cry. That's okay. I'll be a boohoo mess all by myself uh, because God has been good to me. He's been real good to me. Uh, As they old saints say, better than I've been to myself. And so this morning, uh, we talked about the scripture that said, uh, Jesus prayed this prayer. It's called the priestly prayer. And he prayed that his disciples would be one. He says, Father, I'm praying that they would be one as you and I were one. Now, Jesus said all of this before he he left uh, to, to go be back with the father. It was almost like a mom telling her kids, now when I'm gone, you better act right. When, I, when I'm not here, you, you better do everything that you're supposed to be doing. Don't make them call me <laughs> at my job. Well, that's what Jesus was saying, but he, he wasn't saying call me at my job. He was saying, listen, I'm about to go be back by the Father. And what I know about this thing is that you are all going to experience some turmoil with one another. But I have called you to be one. And so I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray that you are one as the Father and I are one. And if if the world sees that you and I, uh, sorry, if the world sees that you are one, they will believe that I sent you. But the problem of the struggle of the church today is that I don't know if they believe he sent, if he sent us. I don't know if if the way that you have See, because this is, this is the problem. It's almost like parents, okay? It's almost like parents who, who go to church, they take their kids to church, and, and you see them at church, it looks like a perfect picture, but at home, it's a hot mess, okay? And, and, and those teenagers, my people, okay, they're watching you. And when your child starts to distract from their faith, they'll come and have a conversation with me and they'll say, and I'm not saying this is the case because this hasn't happened here, I'm, I'm honest. But they'll say, you don't know my parents at home. They are much different at home. They cuss, they, they throw plates, they throw dishes, they throw cast on skillets, they throw Insta pots. I don't know, they different at home, yo. 
And that's what it's almost like. See, we come to this beautiful room, we say amen, so we do all of those things, but we go out into the world and we treat people like we don't know Jesus. Very recently, I started doing something called Lyft. Okay, I like, I have side gigs because I love them. I like shoes, so I like to be expensive. And so, uh, last week, I picked up a guy on Lyft, and, and he got really angry at me and said some really crazy stuff to me. And I'm sitting there, I'm scolding him in the parking lot of Paris Steakhouse like a father scolds his son. I'm saying, you don't talk to people like that. After I put him out of my car, praise the Lord. <laughs> but I wonder this morning if you and I could have a conversation about the prayer that Jesus prayed. You see, my friends, I am afraid this morning that as the church, and I don't mean the little C church, when I'm talking about Christ church, and I will, we'll get to that, but I'm talking about the big C church this morning, everybody, globally, Jesus prayed that his disciples would be unified. He didn't want disunity among them to compromise the message. And beloved, this morning, I believe that's exactly where the church is. Because of a lack of unity in the church, we have compromised the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'm not even sure the world knows he sent us. I want to talk to you this morning about the church that showed up to me when I needed them. You see, at 12 years old, I was outside in my front yard in the city of Detroit, and I was playing outside, and these two ladies come walking down the street in red coats, and I'm like, okay, red coats. I ain't seen that one before. You got the Jehovah's Witnesses. You got the Mormons on the bicycles. You got the game bangers and everybody else. I ain't seen the women in red coats. And so these women come walking down the street, and they, they, they hand me a little flyer, and it, all I saw on it said, now and later, okay? If you don't know what that your kids eat, now and later, that's why I got diabetes now. You know, I ate the little pack of now and laters. And they said, if you come to church, we'll give you a pack of now and laters. And so I ran in the house, asked my mom if I could come, because these strangers are about to give me candy. It, trust me, I know it sounds creepy, but it, it was all legit. <laughs> but what I didn't know that day is that my life would absolutely change because what those two ladies didn't know before they came down my street is that my parents had just got out of the hospital the night before because my stepdad had tried to kill my mother. What they didn't know is that I had suffered so many years of abuse and and my purity had been compromised by other people. What they didn't know is that I was a 12-year-old who had never met his father What they didn't know is I was a 12 years old whose mother was addicted to crack cocaine. And what they didn't know is that I had a stepfather who got so violently drunk very often that he would beat my mother. But they came down my street and invited me to church. I went in, my mom said I could go, it was a Saturday. They picked us up on a big red bus, it looked like Clifford the Dog, and we went to an old broke down theater. Wasn't no fancy carpet. What no pews, it was an old broke down theater with nine tops on the floor from Home Depot and it was filled with hurting and broken little kids just like me. And as I sat in that room that day, at the age of 12 years old, my pastor, Pastor Art Letty got up there. He began to talk about how much Jesus loved us. And you have to begin to know this morning, I had never been told I was loved before. At 12 years old. But that day I gave my life to Christ. I walked an aisle and I committed my life to him because I said to myself, if this guy who knows nothing about me, at least I thought, if he loves me, then I have to give my life to him. And so that's what I did. You see, when the church came and found me, I was in a very dark place. I was living without hope and I needed a united church because I had to go home to a broken home. And many of us don't understand that we can come up here and patty cake and go home about our day. But there are some folks in the room tonight that need to unite in church because they got to go home to brokenness. It appears this morning that the mission of the church has changed, but Jesus is not the one who changed it. We did. You see, Jesus' message and his intentions for the church have always been clear and they have always rung out through scripture. Beloved, this morning, we're just not listening. 
Luke 9, 19, 10, it says, For the Son of Man came to seek and save those who are lost. You see, the mission of the church, like I said, and the gospel has always been clear, but we have allowed our flesh and our desires to mix with the mission of Jesus Christ. And baby, it's like mixing, mixing with water and oil. It ain't going to work. The church needs to get back to being the church, a holy church, a unified church, a loving church, a church that few refuses to bow to the kingdom of darkness. The mission hasn't changed. We've just aborted it. So let me ask you this morning, beloved, do they know he sent us? Do they know he sent us? Do the people that you work around, go to school around, the people, that your waitresses that you're about to go to the restaurant, do they know Jesus sent you by the way that you treat them? My God. Leonard Ravenhill says this, the early church was married to poverty, prisons, and persecutions, but today the church is married to prosperity, personality, and popularity. May it not be any longer. You see, the, the Bible says that the disciples and, and the people in the book of Acts, when the church first began, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread. And everyone was filled with awe and many wonders and signs were performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. That is the church. I ain't reading nothing about no choirs or no praise team or no deacon boards. I read the church was being in the church. They were devoted to one another. They took care of one another. They lived in a culture of prayer. Their attitudes were glad and sincere, and miracles were the norm among them. When is the last time you've seen a miracle church? They gave generously, and they went after the loss. Today, instead of the church influencing the world to change it, we slowly lost our influence because we've compromised the mission. And the world doesn't believe that he sent us. And they don't believe us because we do not love one another. Can I preach this morning? You see, we're not willing to lay down our lives for one another anymore. We're not willing to have hard conversations, but we'll hide behind text messages and emails instead of actual having healing conversations. If you can't say amen this morning, feel free to say ouch. But more than all of that, We refuse to love one another. Jesus set the example for us. Philippians 2, 1 through 5 says this. Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Any comfort from his love? Any fellowship together in his spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then make happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with one mind and purpose. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourself. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take interest in others too. You must have the same, let me, let, me, let, me, let me run that back. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. You see, the early church had a strategy of a radical love, my friends. They had a strategy of radical love. Tertullian says this, the heathen were wont to exclaim with astonishment, behold, these Christians love one another and how they are ready to die for one another. Yes, you tell them, brother. (laughs) You see, the early church loved one another so much they were willing to lay down their lives for one another. Beloved, can I ask you a question this morning? What happened to that kind of love in the church? When do we lose our passion for one another? Romans 12, 10 says this, love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. 1 John 4, 19 says this, we love each other because he loved us. And John 13, 34 and 35 says this, now I am giving you a new commandment. 
Love each other. As just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Church, what's up? You see, when we choose to radically and unapologetically love one another, the world will know he sent us. But until the church wakes up and returns to this kind of love, our congregations, Big C Church, will continue to drip with contention and strife. And we will always be at war with one another while the enemy pillages our families, communities, and our world. Church, enough is enough. We've got to get back to the main thing. I remember being a 12 or 13 year old. I remember my pastor. He would be working so hard, Pastor Ben. He, he, he would, they would take me to their house every weekend so that I could eat and, and have a warm meal and, 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 and you know, have, have a nice safe space. Now, my mama, she took care of me. We did all that. You know, it, 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 wasn't, it wasn't awful, but, but they wanted me to be safe. And so I, I would watch him. My pastor worked so hard. It'd be, I, I'd go upstairs and go to bed, and he'd do and fall asleep on the stairs because he was so tired. Because they came to the city of Detroit. When everybody told him not to go, they said, ain't nothing good down there. There's nothing worthy down there. Why would you go down there? But they put their own wants aside. And they left their cushy home in the suburbs. And they came down to where I was. And they lifted a little 12-year-old boy who was so broken who was so hurt, who was so destroyed at 12 years old. And they told me they loved me. But more than that, they told me that there was a God that loved me and that he cared about me and that he held every tear that I cried. And every time I was abused, he took care of me. Y'all, the church took care of me. The church is what got me through. The church is the reason why I'm standing here before you today, 26 years into this thing called ministry. It is because of the church, but it's because they showed me the love of God. It's because they showed me God's love. I remember the nights they held me when I cried because I found out my mom was addicted to crack and I didn't tell nobody for a year. They held me. They took care of me. They made sure I had food to eat when I couldn't afford to pay graduation fees in high school. They made sure I could graduate. When my stepfather gave my mom two black eyes before my eighth grade graduation, they stepped in and stood in for me. That was the church. So let's return to love this morning. Let's return to one another. The world is waiting. 1 Corinthians 12, 21 through 26 says this, the eye can never say to the hand, I don't need you. The head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. In fact, some parts of the body that seem the weakest and least important are the most necessary. Help me preach, God. And the parts that we regard as less honorable and all of those we clothe with the greatest care. So carefully we protect those parts that should not be seen. While the more honorable parts do not require this special care. So God has put the body together so that extra honor and care would be given to those parts that have, the less, that have less dignity. This makes for harmony among the members so that all the members care for each other. If one part suffers, all parts suffer with it. If one part is honored, All parts are glad. If one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. Christ church, I'm not talking to the big C church no more. Christ church, the body needs you. This body needs you. All of my seniors stand up. If you consider yourself a senior, and I don't mean senior in high school, I mean the opposite end. Come on, stand up, stand up. Come on, if you consider yourself a senior, stand up. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on, come on, clap for him. 
ah, 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 ah. No sit down, no sit down, no sit down. Listen to me, listen to me. We need you. This is not the time to check out. Oh, no, no, no. You still have a place to serve. You, you, you still have a place to serve. You are still very much a part of this church. Don't you dare let the enemy tell you that, that the church has forgotten about you. You still have a place to serve. You still are effective in the body of Christ. As long as there's breath coming out of your lungs, God has something for you to do. Do not allow the lie of the enemy to tell you just because your age is seasoned that he can't use you. The devil is a lie. It's your prayers that got us through. It's your breakthrough that got us through. It's your example that got us through. Don't you dare let the enemy lie to you and tell you that your best days are done. No, no, baby. Your best days are ahead of you. You can be seated. I love you. Where are my students at? If you're a teenager, stand up. 12 on up, stand up. The world is waiting for you. I know you got so much that's going against you. You are facing things that your parents never had to face, and sometimes they ain't got grace for it. I'm gonna be honest. But you also have a purpose. And the church has not forgotten about you either. And it doesn't matter how old or how young you are, you can be you can be used even on this platform, as you saw earlier. I love you all so much, and it is my honor to be your pastor. Don't you dare allow this world to lie to you and tell you that Jesus isn't it. Let me tell you something, young people. I love Jesus with my whole heart, and I will never apologize for that. Even if he hadn't rescued me, I still love him. But do not allow the world to tell you that this thing is wore out and old and of no use anymore. Baby, the gospel still has all the power. Don't let them fool you. I love you. Now step up. Okay, you can sit down. We need each other. To our seasoned saints, this message for you more for you than most. Your prayers have gotten us through. Your faith has been foundational to us. It's not time to throw in the towel. Don't believe the lie. You are loved and you are valued and there is a place for you and your age does not determine your usefulness. I'm going to say that one more time because I don't think you heard me. I said your age does not determine your usefulness. And to all of you that are the church today, there's a place for every single one of you. And maybe there's a 12-year-old like me who's waiting for you to show up in their life. We need each other. We need each other, y'all. Our world needs us. Brent, Brentwood, Antioch, Nashville needs us to be the church. Our students need us to get this right. You see, because when the church isn't unified, it hurts the kids and the students the most. Because they fa- what they face in this world is so devastating for them when the church refuses to be the church. For them, it's not about the music. It's not about the building. It's not about none of that. It's about authenticity in relationships. Because you can have all this, but give me Jesus and I'll be satisfied. Take all of it. Take every single thing, but give me Jesus and I'll be satisfied. And the young people of this world and this age are craving authenticity from the church, baby. You know why? I've worked with young people for 26 years. They can spot a phony just like that. Our young people are craving authenticity. See, I've been doing this for 26 years. And I'm going to be honest with you about our particular youth group. This is the hungriest I have ever seen students for Jesus in my life. 
I'm not joking you. These kids in this church are the hungriest for God to move that I have ever, ever seen in 26 years of student ministry. They are the hungriest. We've got to feed them. Over the past month, every single week, as we end the service, there are kids at the altar. Last month, we had six kids give their lives to Christ. It's because about a month ago, a month and a half ago, we made the decision that as a student ministry, that if the adults in our church didn't want to do it, that we were going to go to be God on their behalf because we want to see revival. I'm tired of reading about it. I want to be a part of it. And so our students got together and we repented. We stood in the gap for you. We stood in the gap for our church. And we said, God, we're sorry. I, we don't care what has went on the last 60 years. We don't care how we've got, we don't care about none of that. God, we just want you. We just want you. I don't, wanna, I don't care about the drama or the confusion or all of this stuff. Just give me Jesus. So we repented. And we've seen God begin to move in our suit ministry. First Chronicles 7, 13 says this, my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven. I'll forgive their sins and I'll heal their land. Yes. Repentance changes the course this morning, beloved. Right. Getting ready to close this morning, but I want you to know this from Revelation 2, 1 through 6. You see, the church, the problems in the church have not... They're not brand new. There's some letters in the back of the Bible that tell you that. And there's been a letter wrote to one of the churches. This is what they said, Revelation 2, 1 through 6. I know all the things that you do. I have seen your heart, your hard work, and your patient endurance. I know that you don't tolerate the evil people. You have examined the claims of those who say they are apostles but are not. You have discovered they are liars. You have patiently suffered for me without quitting. But I have this one complaint against you. You don't love me or each other as you did at first. Look at how far you've fallen. Turn back, that's what run it back is, y'all. To me, and do the works you first did at first. If you don't repent, I will come and remove your lampstand from its place among the churches. But this is in your favor. You hate the evil deeds of the Nicolaitans just as I do. He gave them a word. And he told them that repentance was the key to running it back. Yes. You see, Jesus commanded the church at Ephesus to repent. The Ephesian believers needed to reverse their spiritual decline and serve them as they did when the church began. A, church, a failure to heed Jesus' command would be a swift punishment. The church would not continue to exist as a witness for Jesus. And more than a few churches in our modern era have closed their doors because they have abandoned their love for Jesus. Today, as the Big C Church and as Christ Church Nashville, repentance is the key to see the move of God. I'm going to say that one more time because I don't think you believe. I said repentance is the key for a move of God. And every single move of God has been marked by repentance. We must repent. Why? Because we forgot the mission. We must repent. Why? Because of the words and the ways we have treated others and the ways uh, who have been made in the image of God. We must repent. Why? Because we're wanting our own way for God's church instead of God's way. We must repent. Why? Because we turn God's moments into monuments when they should be movements. So very often, we see what God does. And we take that moment and we celebrate, oh, look what God did. He did this great thing. But the problem is we make that moment into a monument instead of a movement. God does not want the church to be a monument, but he wants the church to be a movement. You see, a monument you can go back to visit. But a movement keeps moving because it realizes that God is doing a new thing. Yes. So church this morning, we must run it back and be the church that God has called us to be. Time is of the essence. People are hurting and neighborhoods all around us are filled with broken people who do not know Jesus. That's right. 
Let's not just be the church on the hill, but let's be the church who goes and rescues the lost from the kingdom of darkness. So where are you this morning, church? Where are you this morning? Christ church, where are you this morning? Could you stand to your feet for me? When I was a kid, I was an old school kid. I used to listen to Sandy Patty. Still do, actually. And I used to listen to this choir. Maybe you heard of them. Christ Church Choir? There's a CD called Christ, Carmen Commission in the Christ Church Choir. When I was 13, 14 years old, that's what I was listening to. And this church meant a lot to me back then, and I never imagined that I would actually end up here. But maybe out in our neighborhoods, there's some clearances out there. Maybe there's some people out there that need to know that Jesus loved them. You see, that day that my life, my life changed. And I love Jesus real bad, y'all. My life was changed that day. And for a moment, could we love one another? As a 12-year-old, that's what I needed my church to be. And I can't imagine what these kids and those kids who are in Sunday school or who are in children's church need from us. And I walked into that place and they built me up and they told me who I was. But y'all, he rescued me and he used the church to do that. He used the church to do that because that's what the gospel is all about. It ain't about our theatrics or our songs or none of that stuff. It is about reaching lost and broken people. And every single one of us in this room has been lost or broken at a time. Don't fool yourself. We got to make a commitment to get back to being in the church. I happen to know that our pastor has been praying for a move of God. It's time for us to run it back to be the church. There are people that need your love. There are people next to you that need your love. There are people that walked into this room this morning with addictions, with things in their life, and they need to know that they can be loved even through their pain. So what say you this morning, church? It's Christ Church Nashville. Let us make the commitment to one another. I'm going to stand with you. I'm going to walk with you. Even when I'm angry with you, I'm not going to be dirty or petty about it. I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to love you. I'm going to pray for my pastor. I'm going to pray for his family. I'm going to pray for my church. I'm going to be there for people that need me. Baby, if you need a ride, I got you. If you need a bag of groceries, I got you. Why? Because that is the church. <laughs> Would you just lift your hands? I'm going to pray and pass it being out late. Father, God, I love you so much. <laughs> Thank you for rescuing me. God, I know they said it wasn't nothing good in Detroit, God, but you, you saw me. And God, I love you so much this morning. God, as a church, God, we repent. We are sorry. We are 
sorry that we let our love for one another grow cold. We're sorry we let our love for you grow cold. Restore the power back, God. Help us not to be petty, God, or bitter, God, or angry or contentious anymore, God. But help us to walk in love with those who are around us. And more than that, help us to be the church to a world that doesn't even know they need it. God, I thank you for this church. I thank you for the legacy of what you've done. But what you've done does not compare to what you're getting ready to do. And so this morning, we honor you, God. We honor the past. You hear me? We honor the past. But God, we're moving forward. And we're trusting you, God, to do a new thing. Do a new thing in this place, God. Do a new thing in this place today, God. And when you do the new thing, God, we'll mark this moment, but we won't make it a monument. Help us, God. We love you. We praise you. In your name, we pray. Everybody said. Don't ever say that youth pastors are junior pastors. It's not true at all. Thank you, Clarence. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So as I speak this benediction over the people of God, you got to answer that question. What, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? And if you say, Ben, I don't know, then you ask, you ask him. You say, Lord, guide me, show me. Let me love the way I have been loved. And if you're waiting for all your own stuff to get dealt with before you love that way, forget that. It doesn't work like that. It doesn't work that way. Choose, decide. The only way that a family makes it is when they commit to each other and say, whatever happens, we're gonna commit to each other and make it through this. The church is not the building, the church is not the event, the gathering, the church is not the programs, the church is the family of God. Let's love each other that way. When we got problems, we work through them. And we trust his word to be the guide that we need to do that. So may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you, be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor. And may he give you his peace. May we go now, wherever he may lead us, to love him, to love each other, to lay down our lives for each other, doing it with joy, knowing that we will know him better as we do. That's who we are, church. That's who we are we are. Let us go in out of love and serve the Lord and one another. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. Amen.